Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, thanks for joining. Today's uh, webinar is uh, all about mortgage investing and uh, it's presented by myself. I'm David Grossman, mortgage broker and a dealing representative and also uh, Jerry Hogenhout. He's a CPA and he's got all kinds of other letters behind his uh, name. He's been licensed in many different uh, areas. And we have a couple of special guests with us today, uh, Stephen Clark and Mark Simone, uh, both uh, welcome guys, uh, VPs from uh, Equity Line Mick. Um, so let's get rolling. I have um, a presentation that I'm going to do and uh, just bring it up on the screen here. You guys uh, see it okay? Okay, so um, in order of what I think is, uh, we, we do have some very experienced uh, mortgage investors uh, with us here today as well. I've seen uh, Terry Wallman is here, uh, Mike Evans and, and others. So uh, got a great crowd. Um, uh, first of all, I think that the uh, one of the most important factors is that, that uh, you've got to ask if you're considering a mortgage investment is, where is the property? That's a key factor. If it's, uh, you know, GTA based or somewhere where there's a, a you know, it's going to sell quickly. Um, that's important because if, 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 if in a small town and Jerry have, uh, have Jerry and I have felt the pain of this, uh, in, in, uh, in one case, uh, for sure where property was appraised at a good price but you know it was it was a very low populated area so if you need to move a property um, and the market is uh, is not moving quickly um, you could have a challenge on your hands uh, what's the loan to value very important that's like key right uh, how much equity is there in the property uh, and and what's the ask because that equity is that's the buffer that protects you in case you you need to take action But it's not just the loan to value right because you know, uh, I remember somebody came to me with a um, With an opportunity in a small town the property was worth, you know, let's say two hundred thousand dollars the loan to value was 75% loan to value sounds okay at 75% but that's there's not not a lot of equity there if you have to if you're not getting paid uh because the uh, the borrower stops paying and then you have to pay legal fees you know you need to consider that as well is a first or second position mortgage that's key and what are you going behind are you going behind a private or are you going behind an institutional mortgage very important questions private mortgages in the event of non-payment there could be a lot of penalties and you want to know that you can be able to work with whoever's in first position if you're in second position um, so that you so that you won't get burned. You have an you may have an option to keep the first uh, up to date. Um, property type, of course, is it is it residential uh, is it, or is it commercial? You know, it's amazing to this day. If, I remember where uh, when I was living in Toronto not that long ago, there's a, this um, uh, big plaza at Dufferin and Steeles. Not the brand new plaza. Well, it's not brand new anymore. But uh, on the northwest corner, there's a plaza there. It's a reasonably good area, right? Dufferin in, in Steeles in Toronto. And they've just, I don't know what it is, but they haven't been able to get good tenants in there. And sometimes you see uh, a commercial property in a, in a good area and with just long-term vacancies. So, um, you know, who is the tenant? Uh, is is also important, I think, in a uh, in a commercial property. Of course, there's 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 going to be more risk with commercial. We all see today what's going on uh, in commercial as well. Um, strength of the borrower, their ability to service the debt, and what's the exit strategy? Uh, that's important. Unless you're somebody who, you know, uh, doesn't mind at all taking legal action if you need to. Uh, and you go into it prepared to that. You may not uh, prepared for that. You may not mind, but most lenders they don't want headaches. They just they want a passive investment. So you need to know that either the borrower has the ability to service the debt, uh, or that there is some money coming in so that you can get out of this mortgage eventually. Um, credit. I think credit may be the least important thing. I mean, let's face it. If somebody's coming to you for private money, there's a good chance that there is 
something about the deal that is not uh, quite right. So if you had to choose among the different options, um, but you know, why, if there's a credit issue, what is the issue and why, right? Because some people may have had a credit issue and now are on the road to recovery and um, banks not gonna lend money until you're two years out of a bankruptcy. <clears throat> institutions will lend shortly thereafter but still a credit is a reason why a lot of people go to private lenders so if you understand overall what what the deal is you know the person can service the debt or there's an exit strategy something to consider it's it's a, a deal worth worth considering um rates really can vary depending on whether you're in first position second position how much risk you're willing to tolerate i've seen rates not necessarily the rate, but lenders will often charge a fee too. We, as mortgage brokers, we hope that lenders' fees are are going to be reasonable because you know we we want to be competitive. We we need to charge a fee too because otherwise we don't make a living. But a lot of lenders can and will charge fees. And when you consider your fee plus your rate on let's say an eighty five percent loan to value second mortgage, um, you can sometimes make as much as as eight percent. But there's usually risk that goes along with that. So important uh, for you to understand what the risks are. I would say typically, you know, um, anywhere between six and 10% is, you know, kind of a safety area. Um, you know, it, you can get a safe second mortgage or something that looks attractive, but you know, the higher the rate goes, usually the um, element of risk goes. The borrower pays for appraisals, the borrower pays for both lawyers in, the, in a mor private mortgage transaction over $50,000. Um, there's, there's, uh, there should be two lawyers. Some lenders will say, I don't care if it's over or, or under. I want um, the borrower to have his own repre representation. That, that does happen. And um, that's, that's the borrower's uh, uh, or that's the lender's um, right to, to make that request if they want to. Um, as I said, the appraisal, I've, I've been weary about, you know, over the years, occasionally somebody sends me an appraisal and I'm like, you know, I don't recognize who the appraiser is. I like to order the appraisal uh, myself for the lender so that, you know, we know uh, that it was our choice and we know who we're dealing with. Um, Today, one of the things that uh, you're going to hear about um, from uh, Stephen and Mark uh, from Equity Line Mick is is about the Mick, the Mortgage Invest Mortgage Investment Corporation. Some of the uh, considerations, advantages with with a Mick, you know, administering a mortgage is a responsibility. So if you're doing your own direct mortgage lending, be prepared. Uh, for for having to do the administration calculations of or you can you can outsource it but then there's an additional fee and a responsibility there <clears throat> um, dealing with uh, you know late payments if they do come in um, some people like direct investing because there's there's more control you can choose the deals that you want to invest in um, uh, but but it is it, it is an added responsibility and um, it takes time. Uh, if you need to take legal action, right? There's out of pocket uh, expenses that you need to deal with if you're a direct investor. If you're with a MIC, um, they'll take care of it. And the if you're invested across multiple properties, which is the one of the principles of, of a MIC, Mortgage Investment Corporation, there's, there's shared risk. So if you have, you know, one mortgage uh, or limited number of mortgages and something goes bad for some reason, you're, you're, share, you're sharing the risk if you're part of a, a MIC. And every MIC will have a different charter or a different mandate in terms of um, target uh, returns, in terms of maximum loan to value, the types of properties they lend on, um, where do they lend? And um, uh, our, my, the company that I am licensed with as a dealing representative, Huxton Black, is, uh, is careful to vet the different um, 
uh, investment opportunities that we put on our shelf. Equity Line MIC is one that we like. We have put it on our shelf. We like their mandate. We like the leadership. Um, before we ask um, uh, the guys from Equity Line MIC to, to present, I thought let's let's open it up for discussion. And also, we wanted to ask we wanted to ask Jerry a bit about uh, RRSP investing. How does that work? A lot of people say, can I use my RRSPs? And then there's also the question of, should I use my RRSPs? So um, if people have questions or comments, feel free to post them. But uh, Jerry, do you want to address the question of, R of, can you use your RRSPs to invest? And then should you? Yeah, great. Thank you, David. Uh, thanks. thanks for welcoming me. Well coming me here again today and welcome everyone who's joining us. So RSPs, yeah, 100%. Um, <clears throat> most of the mix, uh, certainly the ones that I deal with uh, are RSP eligible, which means, uh, you know, that we are allowed to hold uh, mix as an investment. Um, I always say to people, people are a little bit confused about RSPs. RSPs themselves are not an investment. It's really a, a, a vehicle to hold investments in. So, um, you know, it's what we can hold in our investments, uh, sorry, in our RSPs. So uh, I'm a big advocate to hold uh, real estate related uh, investment opportunities such as a MIC or other types uh, within your RSP. Uh, you can do this uh, group lending with a MIC or you can do individual lending too in an RSP, but, uh, you know, holding a MIC inside of an RSP uh, certainly, uh, it, it is there's advantages to it, uh, especially tax advantages. Uh, most mix will pay out as interest, uh, which uh, you know there's different forms of income that we get. Um, but uh, the interest is certainly uh, probably the least favorable. But inside of an RSP, we pay no tax. So uh, holding a mix inside of an RSP makes uh, makes a lot of tax sense, uh, let alone investment sense. So. Yeah, most, uh, I would think all, all mix, uh, I really haven't found a mix that's not RSP eligible, but um, certainly it's a good vehicle to use. And Jerry, you have some uh, unconventional views on RSPs in general. Do you want to uh, <laughs> talk about that a bit? Okay, well, yeah, I mean, unconventional. I don't know, but it's unconventional. I just, uh, you know, I'm, 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 I'm somewhat critical of the way RSPs are utilized, I guess. Uh, I'm not... I'm not saying you shouldn't have an RSP, but I think the investment industry uh, too much just promotes RSPs to uh, hold investments into without really considering all the tax uh, tax implications. Uh, so I'm somebody who says, yes, use RSPs. Uh, you know, you get a tax benefit going in and you get you got to pay tax going out. So as long as the tax benefit going in exceeds the tax benefit, when the money comes out, it's all good. Uh, but over my 40 year career here in the finance industry, I've seen so many situations where people are not, you know, are getting less of a benefit going into an RSP uh, and then they, they pay more tax coming out. Uh, also, RSPs, I call them the ticking tax time bomb. Uh, you know, we got to deal with these, uh, the exits of the RSPs, uh, if not in our life, uh, in our estate. And I'm somebody who's probably done over 400 final death tax returns where I'm the person who gets to say to the kids, you know, sorry about your parents. Uh, they left you a good chunk of money in their RSPs and we have to send half of it to Revenue Canada. So uh, that's a problem. Uh, so I'm not against RSPs. I'm just somebody that advocates they should be used uh, pro properly in the overall financial planning and estate planning uh, structure of people. So. Mike asks, he, Mike Evans is, says, Jerry, are the fees covered? I'm not 100% sure if, what well, he's he, talking he, Mike, about. Mike, uh, covered, I uh, don't quite understand what covered means. Mike, you want to chime in? Uh, so somebody's asking, um, there's a question here. Marino. Self-directed or non, non-directed RSPs. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about uh, self-directed. I mean, uh, you know, in, in, in RSP, if you go to the bank, okay, they have RSPs. Uh, let me let me back up a bit. Every registered plan, be it an RSP, be it a Lira, be it a TFSA, be it an RESP, they have to be administered by a trustee. 
the trustee can kind of uh, obviously they have to follow the rules of 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 of, of, of our uh, of the laws of the land, but they can also create their own rules. For example, you go to a bank uh, and and you say, I want to hold an equity line uh, MIC in my RSP. And they're going to say, get out of here. You can't do that. You know, the banks just want you invested in their bank products. So it's not, you know, when you go to the bank, yes, there's a trustee behind the scenes that administers your registered plan, but they're very restrictive in what you can use. In fact, you can only use their products. A self-directed plan allows you to hold many different options. A, a full-blown self-directed plan really lets you use, uh, put anything that qualifies within uh, the rules of the land inside of your RSP. So, uh, I always, uh, I'm an advocate of a self-directed plan um, simply because then the investor has more choices that they can make either themselves or with their investment advisors. Uh, so we're not restricted. Um, you know, I mean, I, I, I just get upset when, when the industry forces us into a corner and says, you have to use these products. I, I just hate that. And that's the, the industry is really designed in that way uh, too, too, too much. So to have a full blown self-directed RSP, now the person with the money is in control. And again, they can uh, make decisions on their own. They can make decisions with their advisor, but they're not restricted to what they can hold uh, as far as different products. So yeah, the question, the answer to your question, uh, yeah, self-directed in my opinion uh, is much better, especially, you know, there might be a small, small, small extra fee in order to have a full-blown self-directed plan. Um, but the fee is well, well worth it. It might be $50 extra for the year, maybe even hundred dollars to just have a full blown self-directed plan. Makes a ton of sense, I think. So hopefully that answers your question, Marino. Attributes and benefits. I think I've mentioned them. Um, again, just flex, flex, flexibility is the key. Just, uh, again, you always gotta be careful where you get your financial advice. I mean, you walk into the bank, you ask them for an RSP. Boy, I'm going to pick on the banks here a bit because that's when, you know, when when I have a problem with RSPs, I mean, the banks, I mean, we can't compete with their budgets. At, 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 you know, in February, they just, the papers are full of investing RSP February 28th deadline, but nobody really goes through whether you should or shouldn't have an RSP. So that, you know, that just drives me nuts. Uh, so to me, the investment industry really utilizes the uh, RSP component to promote a lot of the products. Uh, but again, we got to step back and figure out uh, whether the investment, when we look at an investment, you know, be it an equity line, neck, be it any investment, we have a choice whether we put that investment inside of an RSP or keep it outside of an RSP. And, and those are decisions that we need to be able to make. Um, so, you know, and again, having a full blown self directed RSP that allows us to make those types of decisions, whether we want it inside of an RSP or whether we want it outside of an RSP. You know, what goes into an RSP needs to come out at a tax rate. If we invest outside of the RSP, we don't have to deal with the tax rate coming out of the investment. Unless, of course, it goes up, but that's a different story. Does that answer your question? There's another one here. Yes, Jerry, it does. <laughs> Yeah. Question there's, from there's Peter. Comment here. I label RSPs as jails and rifts as prisons. Boy, oh boy, I could not have said that any better. My God, that's a good comment. <laughs> uh, I'm going to read it here. Any type of registered fund should be eligible for investing in any type of investing. 100%. Similar to Jerry, I label RSPs as jail and rifts as prisons. I couldn't say it any better. Imperative to have an effective exit strategy. 100%. So, you know, it's just education. It's, it's not rocket science. People just, you know, you, you, you need to get your, your information and education from an unbiased source. Uh, it, I, 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 can I just add to that? So just for clarity, I, I have clients, I'm a realtor and I've been helping people invest in real estate, obviously uh, for, for decades now, but it, it behooves me how, when they go to the bank and they think the bank's the almighty because they've been banking with them for you know decades so they think that they're going to give them unbiased advice no they don't uh, but for them to put the money in the rsp when their marginal tax rate is 15 percent and then like you say by the time they accumulate something they take it out and they're taking it out a marginal tax rate above that like like i really like what you said there like what benefit do they derive going in and for them it, they're, they're singularly focused in terms of 
saving every cent. They don't want to pay any tax. They think if they're paying no tax, they're actually ahead. No, it's like, what are you going to do with that money? If it's going to be sitting in a mutual fund that's controlled by the bank, where they're carving it up when it doesn't perform, even on negative performance. I mean, think about that. Any other industry where there was negative performance, like you go to see your dentist, if they didn't uh, do the dental work they were supposed to, then should they get, do they deserve to get paid? No, but in mutual funds, um, there's an, they're anything but mutual. Okay, you put them in, you have no control, and then they can erode your, 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 your uh, nest egg, if you will, and yet they continue to get paid year after year after year. So it doesn't make sense. That's not an investment. That's an ab- abdication of responsibility. And so I think people just need to be aware and need to be properly guided by, obviously, the specialists that we have here today that can explain this to them. So I'm loving this. So carry on, please. Yeah, thanks, thanks, uh, thanks, Peter. Pete. I just want to add, if I can, David, to Peter's, sure. uh, you know, again, we're on the total same page. So here's some, here's an, here's a, here's a client situation I'll share with you. So client comes to me and, 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 uh, she was, uh, over 70. She just had to start riffing her, her, her RSP, uh, didn't have a lot of income, old age security, Canada pension, but the little bit of riff that she was getting pushed her over the limit where she couldn't get the guaranteed income supplement, which is just an addition to her old age security. Uh, And here was a lady who was, you know, pinching uh, pennies and very concerned that she wasn't getting the guaranteed income supplement. So her RSP was something like her RIF at that point was like 50,000 bucks. It it was very little. But I said to her, I said, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to pull your money out uh over two years we're going to pull out twenty five thousand. now that kept her in this the low tax bracket next year we're going to pull out another twenty five thousand, and that'll keep you in the low tax bracket and then after that you'll get your guaranteed income su- supplement oh my god so she went to the bank to withdraw her money <laughs> oh my god they just refused literally refused to do it telling her it was such a bad idea i couldn't believe it she came back almost in tears and said why the bank won't let me take my money out and i just so i called the bank had it had it out with them explained to them why you know where, where my suggestion made so much more sense for her so this was a situation where not only did the bank really give this lady, uh, in my opinion, no, no good advice over the years, he wouldn't even let her take her money. Eventually, we had to force them to uh, you know, give her her money back. But uh, just a situation where the bank is just protecting their assets. I mean, their golden goose is their 2.5% management fees on these mutual funds that um, they'll put anybody into. So, But anyway, thanks for sharing that, Peter. Uh, your yeah, comment. Peter, Peter uh, Mazukin, a uh, longtime friend and... Uh, great uh, real estate agent so uh, from actus uh real estate agent uh real estate so glad to have you with us today uh peter well, it's, nice, it's nice to be invited and i i appreciate um the education for everyone because i mean obviously the banks don't teach this kind of stuff and I, i'm a former banker so this isn't a knock against the people that work at the bank and work very hard to do so but the reality is they are not trained on the bigger picture and and uh, i'll tell you it's really important to understand the bigger picture because people should always have choices and they should should be guided to make the best choices for them so thank you peter a yeah, um, couple of comments we have uh terry wallman was talking you know just mentioning how important it is to read the appraisal report you know you'd see a, a commercial property in in a small town worth two two million except oops built built without permits built without septic bed uh, no land to create a septic bed. So yeah, definitely got to read those uh, uh, reports and what assumptions uh, are built in. And what's the difference between an as is and as if appraisal? Uh, very, very important uh, point. Rick Rose um, uh, messaged me that he has a question, but it requires some uh, explanation uh, first. So uh, Rick, feel free to uh, jump in with your question. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, I'm a realtor, and uh, like the other gentleman, I believe Peter, uh, I've helped a lot of people make a lot of money in in real estate, and it's kind of I'm taking the the tack now that okay, it's my turn. Uh, the market it, for this this is for the experts, and uh, a little bit of an explanation first. The market here last year in 2020 in Windsor, Ontario, went up 38.3 percent. It's expected uh, to go up somewhere maybe between 28 and 30% over the next 12 months, starting now. Uh, I'm actually being conservative and saying 24%. 
which means prices being a little bit lower here, if any of you bought a $400,000 property uh, now and did nothing, you'd make $100,000 in equity over the next 12 months. So 400,000 now, 96, I'm rounding it up, uh, it'd be worth about half a million dollars in 12 months from now. So I'm thinking, wow, okay, so why, why don't I do that? And if I'm going to make you know, $100,000, I'll probably net, depending on how I do it and costs and everything, maybe $70,000. That, that's great an investment, very secure, it's real estate, so on and so on. Well, if I did one, why not, why not do three? Why not do five? Why not do 10? As long as uh, you, know, you can find the money, the property values are still going up. Uh, and I've been looking at this kind of situation of this scenario for a few months now. And about a month ago, I heard from two or three people some really weird rumors about the budget that just came down, about them taxing principal residences, uh, really affecting investors. So I held off doing anything. Now I'm pretty much ready to go. So the MIC actually it sounds very, very interesting. Uh, I'm curious as to how much of a down payment you have to put down. If I bought 10 properties, 400,000, that's uh, about $60,000 or so, something each. Uh, I don't have that kind of cash for down payment. I could buy two or three, but um, so that's one issue. What would be the best way? And let's round it to five properties. What would be the best way to buy five properties for about a 12 month period of time, uh, which is the most effective for me and still put the, all, the whole thing together, put the deal together. Okay, so that's a good segue, I think, to, um, to get rolling with uh, Stephen and Mark. And um, uh, thanks, thanks, Rick, uh, for joining us. Uh, appreciate you. Uh, Rick presented on um, uh, lease, lease to Own at one of our clinics when people were allowed to leave their houses back about a year, a year and a half ago. Good to see you, Rick. Thanks for chiming in. Um, Stephen and Mark, are you guys ready? <clears throat> and um, and then Jerry, we'll come back to uh, Ian's comment um, momentarily. Ian talks about, uh, is asking about investment advisors not always uh, having the, do they not always have the best? Well, we'll let's come back to that, Jerry. Um, guys, are, are, are you ready? Uh, Stephen and Mark, um, uh, Stephen, I've given you co, uh, a co-host capabilities. You should be able to share your screen. Perfect. Do you see it now? Yes. Okay, great. Well, uh, thank you, uh, David and Jerry. Uh, David, you did an excellent job on going over the overview of, of the mortgage and investing in a mortgage. And, and so that's great. It, it fits really well with what we're going to talk about here. Um, and, and the fact that this, this is mortgage investing, this isn't actually buying the real estate asset, it's have, using the real estate asset as security against the, the mortgage. So. Um, difference between the growth of the the, uh, the real estate property itself in value versus the security of having an asset backing the debt. And uh, so that's what we're going to be focusing on as a mortgage investment corporation. And I'd like to turn it over to, to Mark, our, my colleague, to, to start us off. Well, thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, David. And thank you for the opportunity. Um, so as Stephen mentioned, uh, investing in a MIC is an option. And one of the options that are available to discuss today. So we're going to take you through about 15 minutes. We're going to give you the history of the uh, of the mixed structure, why borrowers are um, uh, growing that utilize MIC as an option, and uh, why a MIC is um, a practical option to invest in for investors. And then we'll go through a quick little uh, investor video to answer a lot of your questions. So I'll start right off the top by reading our disclaimer, which is required. This presentation is to be used for general information purposes only. It's not intended to provide financial, legal, accounting, investment, or tax advice. So Stephen, MICs have been around a long time. Uh, it'll surprise some folks, but uh, why don't you give a little history on it? Sure, quickly, uh, a MIC has actually uh, been around since 1973. And it was an act of parliament that brought in MIX uh, in 1973. Um, it's a new class of a financial en entity. Uh, the reason that uh, the MIX were brought in by parliament was 
um, giving flexibility to borrowers to be able to find uh, new sources of, of funds uh, rather than always going to the banks and, and trust companies. They needed alternative lenders to fill gaps, and that's what uh, the mix came about. So they're federally enacted, uh, but they're provincially regulated. So uh, there is a, a, a lot of regulation that uh, oversees mix and to ensure that uh, uh, ongoing, the OSC is ongoing, uh, reviewing mix on a regular basis. Uh, they are an alternative to traditional mortgages. Um, so again, it's, it's filling that gap where traditional mortgages through your bank uh, aren't feasible. Um, and today, MIX hold over, well, 14 billion of Canadian mortgages uh, on their books. Right. And that's, you know, 14 billion sounds like a lot, but that is growing every day. And there's a, there's a tremendous need for, for MIX by borrowers. So if we can go to the next slide, Stephen, we can uh, just get into some of the particulars of why MIX are becoming so popular as an option for quality borrowers that are looking to have a solution. And it was um, uh, Jerry uh, and David both uh, stepped uh, or addressed this that the, the stress tests are are in place, and and what the government did was put those stress tests through federally regulated um, uh, banking and trusts in, in order to slow down the, the or attempt to slow down the, the housing market and the, and the prices and and what that did is uh, a number of qualified applicants for mortgages that would usually go to a bank or trust that uh, suddenly found themselves not able to apply, um, not able to qualify for a loan. Um, and so they have to seek alternatives, which is a great news for the mix because mix are an alternative, uh, much more flexible in dealing with borrowers. They're not subject to stress tests. Um, also, you know, the employment um, side, people is changing uh, with the demographics. Uh, people are, are more self-employed, they're self-incorporated. Uh, they don't produce a T4 slip. They don't have two years of financial records. So again, going to a bank and, and trying to get a, a mortgage uh, for either buying a home or getting a mortgage to, to be able to do some uh, upgrades to your home. Uh, it's, it's difficult because the bank doesn't, is, is somebody said that the bank's trained this way, that uh, if they're not uh, on the checklist, it's a red flag. Um, there's little flexibility of thinking outside the little checklist box. Um, and also new immigrants, uh, you know, we're a country built on immigrants. Uh, immigrant, immigration will continue to uh, grow this company, our country. Uh, but again, immigrants come with limited or no credit history uh, or income history. So that's a red flag against them in order to qualify for a mortgage. Right. And we're talking about quality applicants, but we're calling, we're talking about, you know, circumstances and our society has changed as well. Like people are not working 10, 20, 30 years um, for the same company. So therefore they're jumping around a little bit. And we've had a lot of circumstances where someone is leaving one position, going to another position, maybe taking a three month hiatus and they find that they don't qualify, even though they're starting a new job. So that's just another example of the changing times and why people are put in the situation of why they'd be looking for another option and mix fill that option. And um, as, as, as Stephen mentioned, and as David mentioned, um, mix are designed to take advantage of the dynamic circumstances in our society today where banks just really aren't as flexible and can adjust uh, accordingly. But mix, we like to think, especially equity line, we do maintain strong underwriting policies and we're dealing with qualified applicants that just circumstantially are found in a situation. So Stephen, we've, we've talked about why mix are growing in popularity uh, for borrowers, but let's uh, you know zone in here on why would it be appealing to the folks watching today, uh, yep. potentially investors in a mix. Yep, absolutely. Um, and, and, and people on the phone today know that uh, real estate is, is a, a growing asset or has been done, done really well. Um, houses generally keep their, um, their appraised value or, or increase. And so it's really a hard asset security. Uh, these loans and, and the loans are short term loans that are generally done through mix. Uh, generally up to 18 months or less than 12 months. Um, these loans are secured against the hard asset of a, of a home and, and mostly residential homes. Um, and that is key because uh, if you have to go into default and you have to do something with the home, you're, you're able to do it in a, in a, with, with um, uh, 
trust that the, the market and the valuations will hold because of uh, the location and that Davis spoke about location as well. Um, location extremely important to where we um, find um, these assets and securitize against them for lenders. Um, also, the mix aren't reliant, they're not REITs. So we're not reliant on uh, rental income. Uh, it's not, uh, we don't have to find res uh, tenants to occupy a home. That's up to the, the borrower uh, if, if they're using the home as an investment property. Uh, so it's, it's interest payment. And if you don't pay your interest, we are uh, able to um, get the home and uh, secure our assets and, uh, and recover our, 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 our payments. Right. So, it's, it's different than uh, than a REIT in this this case. And I was going to say, you know, the difference between, you know, not paying your mortgage uh, interest payments is that you potentially could fall into personal bankruptcy or other disposition you don't want to. Canadians have a propensity to pay their mortgage interest payments, probably yeah. one of the top countries in the world. When you just compare it with the United States, it's about seven and a half times higher than Canada. So that's, that's an important factor. And and David also overviewed that we went through a due diligence process with uh, Huxton Black, which is the dealer in which uh, David is licensed through. So they look at the things like regulatory structure and oversight and, the th and all the elements that mitigate risk. And uh, uh, Huxton Black, you know, does a pretty aggressive job. So we like to think that uh, as a MIC, uh, we at Equity Line, you know, do provide the regulatory structure and oversight that are required to um, best protect the investor. And I know David, uh, right off the top, talked about in his uh, short overview about pooling versus individual mortgage investing. And he mentioned today that there were several seasoned individuals that have enjoyed success through individual mortgage investing. And there's other investors that maybe have not participated, but this is, as mentioned, a passive income or reliant on a third party um, structure uh, could be appealing to both sides of, uh, of, of who, where you stand today as, as a visitor. So Stephen, let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the value of a, of, a mortgage in, uh, of a mortgage investment corporation, perhaps versus an individual mortgage structuring. Yeah, and it's, it comes down to the professionally managed, um, the experts, the, the team that's, that's running the MIC, uh, the investment team running the MIC. I mean, that's their sole focus is to, to look at the mortgages, manage the mortgages, um, anything in default to, to uh, fix that, to, um, to do the financing, to raise funds. So it's, it's all about risk mitigation um, as well um, in, to be accountable to the shareholders and that's the investors. Uh, and you, when you compare this against an individual mortgage, um, you know, investing or a couple of mortgage um, out there in your, your portfolio, you, the, the whole thing about investing is diversification. So if you want to put your eggs all in one basket into one mortgage, um, you can do so. Uh, but the pool idea obviously helps to mitigate through diversification. Um, the, as, as mentioned, we have a robust default recovery. Um, um, actually, Equity Line has not had any defaults, so we haven't had to execute this default recovery mechanism. Uh, but in other private uh, investments that we deal with, we have, and uh, we're very strong at being able to recover funds and take action immediately. Of course, we don't want to kick people over their homes. We work with uh, homeowners, but we're not uh, not somebody to sit by and hope that uh, they'll start paying again. So a default recovery is very important. Uh, again, our sophisticated underwriting and expert management team, we have deep experience in that. Um, we are in the GTA area, which is, uh, as David mentioned, important to be in a place where you know the home uh, has value and, and will be able to sell if you need to have it. Um, we're also, we work with mortgage brokers and we work with other um, channels to help make sure that we have a steady access to deal flow. And that's extremely important because you want to be able to look at uh, and take the cream 
of the deal flow that's out there. You want to have as many applicants coming in through your door, filter them and be able to choose the ones that you feel meet your criteria, um, have the, the risk profile um, and you're comfortable with in loaning. So mm -hmm. having that deal flow and options allows you to do that versus right. one, one or two opportunities that may present them to and yourself. I and De both David and Jerry both talked about the tax shelter efficiencies, uh, if right. applicable in particular situations. And MIX also have the flexibility of raising capital outside of uh, traditional investors becoming shareholders is that we can on growth uh, be approved for lines of credit or a special purpose vehicle, which ultimately does benefit the shareholder because the, we are basically raising capital at a lower, a, a lower distribution amount that we will be paying an investor, so which we'll get into in a couple of seconds. So there is a growth opportunity that actually benefits the uh, the investor as well. So at this point, we like to sit back and show you a quick video. It, it, it is sort of talking about the high highlights of the equity line MIC. It will answer a lot of your questions, and it's designed to do that. So sit back, enjoy, and let's uh, let's watch a quick video. Welcome to Equity Line, a Canadian mortgage investment corporation. We offer qualified investors an investment option that provides a way to invest in a pool of Ontario residential mortgages. It's an investment opportunity that offers regular income with a minimum monthly dividend backed by secured assets, managed risk, and regular reporting. Investors purchasing Equity Line Series B preferred shares have historically received a minimum 8% annual dividend paid out monthly as interest for the duration of the investment. Future targets are 8 to 10%. Please refer to the offering memorandum for complete details of the company's share classes and their associated rights and restrictions regarding rate of return and redemption rights. Our investment strategy focuses on a few key items. Mortgaging quality properties is number one. We invest in a mix of first and second mortgages. We focus on short-term loans that are secured in first or second place against assets. Mortgage duration is targeted at 6 to 12 months. We have portfolio policy restrictions on loan-to-value ratios. Our policy requires a maximum 80% loan-to-value. Real results show an average range between 71% and 75%. We also target lower loan amounts our mortgages average less than $300,000. The bulk of our mortgages are core urban residential properties in Greater Toronto and other major Southern Ontario cities. Our qualified borrowers are often individuals seeking short-term funding for property improvements or other value-add objectives. Through to September of 2020, more than 93% of funds were invested in residential mortgages. Since incorporation, the company has had no defaults and no foreclosures on any mortgage investments. We've made all dividend payments since inception at a minimum 8% to our shareholders. As significant, there has been no negative impact arising from the pandemic. There is a well-established demand for mortgages that meet our criteria. We connect to that demand through our well-established and growing network of Ontario mortgage brokers. The management team at Equity Line possess the skill and experience to manage the investment described in this presentation. Note that management strongly believes that alignment with investors is important and has invested personally. Please check our website for complete resumes of our management and our board. Our Series B preferred shares are available to qualified investors who invest pursuant to the terms of our offering memorandum. The price is $10 a share. The minimum investment is $5,000. The Series B preferred shares are RRSP, RRIF, RDSP, TFSA, and RESP eligible. They can also be invested in some individual pension plans or IPPs. Our Series B preferred shares should be considered by investors looking for a predictable monthly income backed by secured assets, well-defined risk mitigation strategies, a history of success with a carefully selected pool of secured mortgages, and regular quarterly reporting with audited annual financials. 
Please bear in mind that this presentation is a summary and is for information purposes only. For full details of this offering, please refer to the Equity Line Mortgage Investment Corporation Offering Memorandum. It's on our website. Investment must generally be made through a registered dealer. Please speak to your financial advisor for more details of the investment process and to obtain a subscription package. And if you want to know more about mortgage investment corporations generally, well, we wrote the book. Get your free copy at equitylinemic.com. Welcome to... So, um, I hope that answered some questions and gave you a little bit more insight on Equity Line. And as mentioned in the video uh, through David and Jerry, we'd like to offer anybody today a hard copy of that book that we did uh, publish just uh, three months ago. And I think it'll be really insightful for you to better understand the MIC product in particular, obviously the difference between private and public markets, it's important to understand. And uh, Stephen, like we, we, we actually yeah. do an analysis and compare it to other real estate investments yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah we do. And, and it's so focused, we didn't just want us to talk about MICs, we wanted to talk about the real estate space. So we uh, took a look at, at REITs, we took a look at limited partnerships, et cetera, and just really define what they are, the, the pros and cons. Uh, through them and uh, what what could make sense to you, your own personal situation, your comfort level with uh, risk and time horizon um, and liquidity. The the other thing we did is we, we did a uh, checklist of a high quality, um, what to look for in a high quality list, the MIC. Um, so uh, that is there and, and you should, if you're look, interested in investing in a mortgage in a MIC, is uh, ensure that the MIC you're going with, you know, where they fall off on this checklist. Um, and uh, we do that for Equity Line in the last chapter. Uh, we just go through that checklist and talk about how Equity Line compares to that checklist. So we, we do have it electronically and we do have hard copies of it. It's about 120 pages. It's a quick, quick read. Um, lots of uh, lots of pictures, which is great, uh, <laughs> and graphs. So we'd be more than happy to send you a hard copy if you'd like, or we can send you a link to the uh, electronic copy. Uh, if you can just let David know um, that you're interested in getting a copy and provide him with your um, email or provide him with your mailing address, uh, we can get that off to you as soon as possible. Right. And um, at this time, David, I'll throw it over to you. Like we're obviously available to answer any questions. If I saw some popping up during the uh, course of the video and through the presentation. So um, at your, at your maestroness. <laughs> Thank you. Good presentation guys. Thanks a lot. I just posted my uh, email address. Uh, so just send me a note. Um, if you'd like to have uh, the book mailed to you, send me your address or um, if you just send me an email saying you want it, we'll send you an electronic copy. Uh, of the book, uh, no problem. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, let me just see if there's other questions. I know, Jerry, you wanted to uh, comment. You wrote an answer here, but you just want to want to give us a, a brief uh, synopsis uh, of, of what this is about um, with regard to our, whether the investment advisors are, act, in your view, are acting in the best interest of clients. Yeah, I mean, that's not really MIC related, but i um, glad to touch on it. But uh, unless you want to stay on this MIC topic for a second. Anyway, well, I don't see any other questions at yeah. the moment. People are, are sending me messages that they'd like to have the, uh, the book. So I'm just going to make notes on that. Um, if you have anything, Jerry, comments regarding the comments. presentations. Yeah, so, so go um, ahead, jump in. Yeah, um, first of all, uh, Great presentation, very, very, very uh, informative. Thank you, uh, Steve and Mark. Um, so, do you guys? Um, so, in your mix, do you do? Do you have commercial or not? Is it all residential? Sorry, you probably um, that, we I, we right now actually it showed ninety three percent in the uh, in the video. But okay. currently, in the last quarter, we 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 bring up you know we redo the numbers every quarter. Ninety seven percent are residential. Um, we do have 3% commercial. Commercial is always corner lot. It's almost uh, our founder owner. Is, he's been in the real estate industry for nearly 20 years. And okay. the only commercial that sort of gets into our portfolio is something that we wouldn't even mind it if they defaulted. It's such a key. 
commercial asset, but we do keep it very, very low. It's not our focus. GTA is also our focus, as mentioned. We will do the odd um, home in London or Ottawa if we feel very comfortable, but with the GTA, that's where our 50, 60 years of combined real estate experience is within our management team. Interesting that you mentioned, uh, you know, in the case of defaults, because I'm just wondering, do you structure your mortgages that, you know, in the case of default, which uh, it, in a lot of cases presents a, an, an extra opportunity for investors? Um, you know, I've, I've, I've seen, you know, I've, I've seen enough situations where they go power sale or, or foreclosure, yeah. and, and by the time the dust settles, as long as the loan to value is okay, the investor is coming out way ahead because of the fees that are charged and the extra clauses that the, so I've seen situations where the investor comes out, you know, with a, a much greater rate of return if in case these things default. Yeah. So just curious if you structure your mortgages that, uh, you know, hey, if there's a default, there, there's fees that are like, crazy yep. things that are paid and uh... yeah i want to steven let me just jump in on i have a okay. I, I do have a true i have a story that might actually reflect that about a year and a half ago we hired an independent third party to do a complete review of our model as we were growing the scalability etc cetera, etc cetera. so we gave them complete access to all our management team and during the interviews and as steven mentioned previously the mick Equity line has not had a default. We've only had a couple of, you know, bounce checks that were ratified and cleaned up within a month or two and the COVID didn't affect us. But during the analysis with our compliance officer and underwriting principles where they have worked with other groups or worked within mortgage situations, exactly to your point, if you have a robust and effective recovery strategy with the fees that are um, triggered, the ultimate net disposition to the mortgage investment corporation can actually be a positive for the investor versus a negative. You, you hate to sort of go out there and say, Hey, if we get, if we have defaults, it's probably good. It's very paradoxical and thinking it's not an intuitive flow, but to answer your question, yes. And we are on the position if we're sitting in a second, you know, we are, we have the capacity to take out the first or, you know, align with the first very quickly because of our ability to do such with um, accessing lines of credit and having available funds to do that. So Stephen, I don't know if you want to add to no. that or not. No, that's fine. And it's good. And, and, and because our terms are short, we, we can, you know, you can find that, uh, that money pretty quickly to, to take out the first. If right. Be. There's so a number come, of questions that yeah. came in too. So when yeah. you're ready, um, Go ahead. Uh, did, is there, was there something more you wanted to say on that, Stephen? No, no, I was okay. just looking at okay. the questions too. Okay, very good. So, yeah, there's so. A, uh, question on the taxes there, David. Uh, okay, so uh, just, just going in order, Rick McGrath is, was asking, do you have to follow the same rules as the banks regarding default recovery, i.e. power sale, or would you start a foreclosure as a last resort, of course? Uh, you would, uh, Steve, Mark, you would react the same as a bank would. Have. Absolutely. Right. We have a very detailed, organized default recovery, which is very uh, similar to the bank right. process. And we are guided by the same laws and regulations. Right, 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 right. Okay, very good. Um, Thank you. No, another question. Uh, sorry, here. Um, our mixed text. Yeah, go ahead, because I'm, tr I'm trying to leave through. Uh, go ahead. How are mixed tax? Good, good question. Jerry, do you want to answer that? Yeah, I'll jump in. So mix basically, um, uh, they, 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 they basically distribute all their net income back to the uh, investors. Uh, it is in the form of interest. Um, so uh, again, when we invest money, any types of money, uh, we there's three traditional types of returns uh, being interest, which we get taxed. We have to put the full amount on our tax return. Now we can get uh, capital gains, which we only have to put 50% on our tax return, or we can get dividends, which give us some tax preferential treatment. Uh, so we basically put three quarters of the dividend on the tax return. There's also return of capital, uh, which uh, some of the listeners know about uh, in regards to real estate income trust. But where tax, the money that comes from a MIC is taxed as interest uh, and we're putting it on the tax return. And uh, that's why back to my previous discussion, uh, a MIC is a good vehicle to hold in an RSP. It's a great vehicle to hold in an RSP because we do not have tax implications, at least while we hold the asset within that RSP vehicle. So uh, when we look at different types of investments and where to hold them, because most of these investments that we talk about week after week can either be held inside of an RSP or outside of an RSP. So uh, certainly a MIC is a, 
a preferred uh, product within an RSP. So. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Jared. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry, if I can just jump in. Uh, Steve, Mark, do you, do you have any capital gain component, uh, like inside that mix, right? Are you actually buying some, like I know you do lending. Do you actually buy some assets and then create a gain and that gets distributed through a capital gain dividend of any sort? Or? We are looking at uh, a future um, to buy, because we can hold up 25% of physical uh, real estate into uh, the corporation. Uh, right now, we don't. Anything that we have that's being held physical is because of foreclosure or, um, uh, we, or we take the asset over and run it ourselves. Um, but we will be doing more of that in the future to, to do that capital gain um, yeah. option. And are you, uh, so, so yeah, I understand that too, that you can hold 25% of your assets in, in physical, uh, physical real estate. Is there, are there restrictions to what type of uh, real estate you can own, where you can own it? Um, maybe you can share some insight in that. Yeah, the restrictions are at least 50% has to be residential uh, mortgages. Um, as far as the assets we, we hold ourselves, I don't believe there's any uh, restrictions, there, but the portfolio itself has to be uh, within the guidelines that are dictated federally. There, there is one. Uh, there is one requirement, Jerry, that if you're holding development or holding a right, real estate asset, there has to be a defined. Uh, there has to be defined uh, interest payment. There has to be a defined payment structure going into the MIC. It can't be in advance. Got it. Yeah. And, okay. and we stay away from, yes, Mick, stay away from development. Yeah. Question from uh, Cam. At this point in time, how much of the money is invested? In other words, how much cash would you have on hand? Well, right Our, now we deploy, we normally like to have every, you know, as much deployed as possible because we do have the capacity to take out a first if we have to, but we, uh, so we don't create, we don't, we don't maintain a big reserve because it's not making money. We're deploying 97, 98% of the AUM app assets under management that we do have in because the demand is so strong. Um, we do have within our service corp or our management company ability to do other mortgages. And so therefore it adds to the robustness of the equity line overall model. So, but in the actual MIC itself, uh, deployment is about 98, 99% um, of, of, uh, of that. And as Stephen indicated, in the event that because we have short-term mortgages, every month we're having three, four, five, six mortgages, um, you know, closing out. So therefore the available funds to take out a first can be utilized that way in a default situation versus a deployment of uh, another mortgage. Okay, there's also a question, how liquid are the shares for emergency cash out? And also what rates are being charged uh, to borrowers for first and second mortgages? Uh, you want me to dance? I, uh, I'll, I'll, well, go ahead. Uh, yeah, the, the rates uh, uh, for first and second range between eight and eight and eleven percent uh, could be you know, could be lower seven to eleven percent for uh, first versus uh, second. Uh, our ratio for first versus second is about seventy. What agree? Seventy five uh, second. It's seventy. It's thirty percent first, seventy percent seconds, second. and the. The annual in our last annual uh, audit was 11.1 uh, earned interest on that right. portfolio. Mm -hmm. so, and uh, the seconds, uh, again, are very much um, uh, underwritten very carefully. Uh, you know, we, we're not, uh, these aren't, uh, these, these aren't, these are quality second mortgages that, would, that we go into. Um, as far as redemption, Mark, do you want to? Uh, talk about redemption, redemption uh, it is a three-year investment uh, there is um, there, there is a one-year seven percent um, penalty if you take it out within the first year then it's four percent in the second year and then it's two and a half percent in the two percent in the third year so in the event that you want to have a redemption there will be an applicable penalty which again, if you align with an 8% return with an end of year round out return that would add to that 8%, uh, that's the way it's structured. And when you do take it out, there is a $100 administration fee, um, but it can get to you within 30 days plus a 30 day administration cycle. So within 60 days upon request, up to a half a million dollars in against the assets under management, um, they, it can be taken out. So it is a three year hold with some penalties to pull it out, as I just discussed. 
Okay, I just want to try and get some clarity on something because the, the question was asked um, once or twice. Somebody sent me a private message and I'm hearing different terms. Dividends normally have a preferred tax treatment, but I, I understood from Jerry's comment, and I apologize if I, if I didn't get it right, that it's treated as interest income, which yeah. is 100% taxable. Yeah. They, they, they call it, it is dividends because you're buying shares in, in the, the, the corporation. Uh, so it's considered dividends, called dividends, but it's not treated as uh, dividends from uh, like normal dividends. And, and that's defined by the, the tax. Um, it is treated as income, interest income. Okay, yeah. so which is why Jerry was talking about the benefits of having it in your RSP. Correct. To Correct. at least defer that. Terry is asking, how is the MIC management compensated? Uh, we actually have a very low compensation model. It's 1% uh, management fee. That's annual. Annual, yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so um, uh, I'm just going to put my uh, contact in here again if people... Yeah. Please, we'd love to send you a book if you if you're interested in a book. Just yeah. So a number of people have um, have posted that they're interested in the book. Uh, right. So I've taken that down. Um, hopefully, I don't miss anybody. If I do, just send me a note, and we'll get you the book. I've, there's my phone number there. And um, Jerry, do you want to just post your contact again, uh, just in case? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I'll post my contact just to address the question with Ian about. Um, I, can't where's that question again i should probably financial advice discuss that more. right that's a good note to end on right jerry where is that where i'm just trying to find his comment or do they not have our best interests at heart okay so i don't want to be uh, overly critical um <laughs> but I, you know, I, I good segue the investment industry is structured very interestingly and uh i, I put a note in the chat bar i have actually i've, I've authored a brochure how 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 I see how the investment industry operates. Uh, it addresses that question. Um, the uh, regulatory system, um, you know, the, anybody that's interested in this, uh, reach out to me. I'll send you this uh, brochure that I've authored. Uh, I'm, I'm someone that's a bit critical how investment advice is dispersed in today's marketplace, uh, and there is a greater need for unbiased. Uh, financial advice and financial information. So uh, all that information is in my brochure and I'm glad to send it out to anybody who uh, is interested in reading that. And I'll put my email address in the chat bar and I'll leave it at that. All right, so contact Jerry or myself uh, for more information. Um, there's you know, some rigor around helping people to, to establish a proper investment portfolio. Um, and uh, and and that's our job. So uh, give us a call uh, next week. What happens if your uh, if your um, uh, purchase doesn't close? A lot of people have been out buying houses, bidding, overbidding, and then they find out that they can't get financing. So we're going to have a lawyer Bob Aaron, uh, also um, real estate agent Barry Lebo. Uh, on a call and the following week of after, after that, I'm doing something on how to achieve your real estate goal sooner with um, uh, creative mortgage financing and, and with some live music, that'll be in an evening. So you can bring your BYOB for that one. That's in, <laughs> that's in a couple of weeks on Wednesday night. So thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, appreciate the presentation, uh, Stephen and Mark, Jerry. Thanks for um, being here. Have a, a great uh, rest of the week. Let's hope it warms up. Go get your COVID shot, and uh, we'll see you next week. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Take Bye. care. See you, Mike. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank you.